And that's our show. Nothing tomorrow night as it's cooling off day. Now, please remember to vote. The last presidential election was decided by just over 7,000 votes, but 118,000 people did not vote. So your vote counts. Your vote matters. Your vote is secret and you have a choice. Remember to vote. Now here it is, your moment of Zen. Whoever governs Singapore must have that iron in him or give it up. This is not a game of cards. This is your life and mine. Whoever, ha whoever governs Singapore must have that iron in him or give it up. This is not a game of cards. This is your life and mine. Thank you. You can bring the lights up. Thanks. So he looks terrified, doesn't he? And the reason why that is is because all the sentiment on the ground on social media was actually against the PAP on the, uh, on the eve of the election. And this is because um, in 2011, the Workers' Party, the main opposition party, won an unprecedented six seats in the 2011 general election, plus a seventh seat in a subsequent by-election in 2013. And this had led many to herald that Singapore has reached a, a new normal for democracy, right? One which would see greater opposition participation in parliament to act as a check and balance on the ruling PAP, the People's Action Party. And so before this election, before the 2015 election, pundits, you know, uh, observers, commentators were predicting that opposition parties could win up to as many as 16 seats, which admittedly is not many given that there are 89 seats in parliament. But that is what passes for, you know, a new era of democracy in Singapore. And it would be an unprecedented repudiation of the PAP not seen since the years before independence. And so during the opposition, during the election campaign, opposition rallies were greeted by rapturous crowds and the ruling party, as you can see, seemed often on the verge of panic. And Lee Hsien Loong there trying to channel Lee Kuan Yew, you know, in a, there was a rally at Boat Key, I think on the 8th, you know, actually directly quoted his father and came across, as you can see, as a very, very pale imitation. So he was running scared and indeed, you know, the, the whole ruling party seemed to be running scared. So the outcome on the 11th, you know, with the PAP winning 60, nearly 70% of the vote, holding on to all their seats, indeed gaining back one of the seats from the Workers' Party, this was a shock to all who, was, uh, who, all who were, were observing the election. You know, a shock to nearly everyone who predicted a far tighter outcome. Why? I think various commentators since have um, proposed a lot of different answers that Singaporeans somehow are accepting of authoritarianism, um, that uh, the opposition is not credible, that the PAP has actually responded to change, that they have improved things. So today I'm going to discuss various factors, right? First, the structural ones, okay? Then the negative incentives, why did people not vote for the opposition? Then the positive ones, why did people vote for the PAP? Before we, uh, you know, pulling everything together and we'll draw a bunch of conclusions from all these trends. At times, I might seem to go a long way out to explain the historical context, so I hope you can bear with me. There is a lot of background uh, to the current PAP dominance of Singapore. And I'm going to assume some familiarity with uh, Singapore. So, uh, you know, I, if, you, if you don't know some of the acronyms or the things I'm talking about, feel, feel free to stop me and I will just, uh, you know, explain. Okay? So, structural. And to understand the proper context of Singapore's elections, we need to start with the overall structure which can be summed up in this phrase. We don't have free and fair elections. We are not a democracy. And to assume that we are, that the, the elections were a reflection of popular will is to make the mistake that, uh, you know, Singapore is a democracy. So keep in mind that I'm not saying the elections were outright rigged or stolen. But what I'm saying is that the situation is far more complex than people assume and that there are a lot of structural factors that prevent real democracy from occurring, or any form of democracy indeed, from occurring in Singapore. And we need to understand a lot of different factors to begin to get at the truth. So, 
the first thing, of course, is that the elections department is not an independent body. It's part of the prime minister's office. It's directly controlled by the prime minister and by the cabinet. And this allows the PAP to, put the, to set the elections at a time which suits them, to set the circumstances of the election entirely favourable to it. Now, election boundaries were announced on the 24th of July, and they were heavily gerrymandered in favour of the PAP because they know how each polling district voted so they can arrange constituency boundaries to suit them and to maximise PAP victories. So you end up with crazy boundaries like Marine Parade GRC over here. It's a littoral, you know, a seaside uh, constituency going all the way into Serangoon up there, right? Tanjung Paga. This is Tanjung Paga. So what is all of this up here? Um, this, this is a pointer as well, right? Yes, how do I... Actually, yes, okay. So this is Tanjung Paga right here. So what is all this up here, right? Marine Parade is here. So what is all this here, right? Haokang Stadium was in Ang Mo Kyo, not in Haokang, for example. Holland Bukit Tima, Holland Village is here. You know, and yet Holland Bukit Tima is called Holland Bukit Tima. And indeed, probably the best illustration of this is the massive constituency that was created in 2011 called Momin Kalang. which you can see right here, which completely disappears just four years later. So they just add and delete constituencies just to suit the, the, the government and to maximize the government vote, right? It's just gone, you see, it's right there in the center. It's divided among four other constituencies. And this means that for opposition parties, right, hard work walking the ground, getting to know voters, putting in the effort, building up grassroots can be wiped away just at the stroke of a pen. So, for example, Yi Jian Jong in Ju Chet, right, um, was folded into Marine Parade. Ju Chet is, was the only constituency without public housing, without HDB blocks in it. And so people thought it had more of a chance because people there, as I'll talk about later, were less reliant on the government. And so, in order to avoid that, it was folded into Marine Parade. Conversely, you have Marceling UT up here, which is a completely new one, right? And if you look at the previous one, Sembawang is there, and now it's mostly part of Marceling UT. And the Singapore Democratic Party spent four years working the ground in Sembawang, only to find suddenly there's a whole new constituency which embraces all this over here who had never met a Singapore Democratic Party candidate. So that is the challenge itself. And of course, you'll notice that there are ones labeled GRC and there are ones labeled SMC. And of course, GRC is a group representative constituencies where you elect three, four, five, or six MPs as opposed to the SMCs where you just elect one. And the GRCs raise several barriers. In these constituencies, right, the point of its creation in 1988 was to raise barriers against the opposition. And then after that, they were fiercely attacked by many people as being completely unnecessary. So then a new rationale was added that, oh, it's to ensure um, racial representation, so a minority has to stand in these GRCs. But that was only added on after the GRCs were created. And ironically, since the creation of the GRCs, there have been fewer minority race MPs in parliament than before the creation of the GRCs. So what they do is they not only raise the barriers, because it's hard enough for opposition parties to find someone brave enough to stand. Now you need to find three, four, five, or six people but you also need to find someone who can be certified as a minority, and not everyone can. Even if you think you're Malay, the Malay Council might not certify you as Malay, right? And then it allows the government to then spread around their top talent. So instead of every minister, you know, someone who's re respected defending one seat, now he can defend six. And for example, the Prime Minister's GRC, Ang Mo Kyo, has six seats. So five other people can come in on his coattails. Even if we hate the other five people, the prime minister himself is probably going to win. So you know, it, it raises the barriers that way as well. And the continuous growth in the number of seats. Four years ago, we had 87. Now we have 89. Right? That makes it increasingly hard for the national leadership of any opposition party to effectively build up enough people. You know, if you're aiming to eventually form the government, the goalpost is not only shifting, it's moving further and further away. So in terms of timing, Parliament was dissolved 25th August, Nomination Day was 1st September, Election Day was 11th September, but on the 10th of September is Cooling Off Day, as you saw my video earlier, and on Cooling Off Day, campaigning is not allowed. And this also includes the online independent media, 
And this means that um, only the mainstream media reports and therefore the PAP gets the final word because the mainstream media will dutifully report what they said. Right? And this also means that there are effectively only nine days of campaigning. And because the opposition parties cannot get started right, printing election materials, preparing to print, you know, bringing together volunteers, organizing their campaign until the election is called, effectively, it was called 25th August, so they had four working days. right? There was a Saturday and a Sunday in between that. They had four working days to do a massive logistical exercise that the PAP, because they know when the election is, had been preparing for for months. So, you know, it's printed, uh, printers for materials, volunteers, election agents, counting agents, polling agents, organized rallies, get equipment, massive logistical exercise, and where is the money going to come from? And on nomination day, you have one hour to nominate. That's it, right? It's not a whole day. If you screw up in that one hour, if someone forgets something, if you make a mistake on the form, that's it for another four or five years. So, you know, the, the window is minuscule. Right? And of course, the election deposit is $14,500, and you need at least 12.5% of the vote, which is significantly higher than other uh, countries with Westminster systems. And of course, the, you know, there's a long history of the PAP arresting and suing opposition politicians, detaining them without trial, bankrupting them, using a legal and parliamentary system which they control to um, otherwise you know, eliminate opposition politicians or just smear them. So good quality candidates are highly discouraged from standing for parliament, from getting involved in politics. And to be fair, this effect has weakened somewhat. The recent election saw some really qualified people standing for the Workers' Party and the SDP, the Singapore Democratic Party. But the PAP still uses this past in its favour, and they hammered away at the fact that in 1996, Dr. Chi Sun Juan, the Secretary General of the Singapore Democratic Party, you know, was convicted by a parliamentary privileges committee of lying to parliament. And this parliamentary committee, we can't pretend that it's fair. It was heavily loaded with uh, PAP, um, you know, uh, MPs and, and, and loyalists. So, um, but they neglect the unfair nature of the system and instead, you know, just hammered away at this, the fact that, oh, this guy was convicted of lying all these years ago. How can you trust him? And over and over again, it was questions that they, keep, they kept saying, we, you, you know, even if you vote opposition, you must vote for people with integrity. Right? So it was an indirect attack on Dr. Chi. And of course, this is despite the fact that the elections department issued guidelines specifically uh, banning uh, negative campaigning practices. It specifically said candidates are not allowed to engage in negative campaigning practices. Right? And that leads me to the next point that the law is not fair, right? Singapore does not have true rule of law because there is one rule of law for the PAP and one for the opposition. Okay, so for example, the law says that only photos of people actually running in a constituency can be displayed at their constituency, which is why the whole country saw photos of Lee Hsien Loong everywhere, right? That's illegal. But when people complained, the police said, oh, well, you know, it, it, there's this interpretation where the leader of a party is representative of a party, and so therefore it's perfectly fine for him to have his photo in every single constituency everywhere. And of course, the opposition can't do the same. They don't have the money to go and print posters at the last minute you know, and put them all up. So instead, the, the, the whole country was treated to posters of his smiling face everywhere. The, the police specifically said before the election started, because it overlapped to the seventh month, that politicians cannot get involved in Gertai, right? They cannot appear at the seventh month Gertai events. But five times, uh, a Singapore, uh, sorry, a PAP politician appeared at a Gertai event and spoke, right? Police reports were filed, no, actions, no action has been taken, right? On the flip side, a workers' party supporter painted his truck and put up lights to uh, support the workers' party. This is not illegal. The police told him to stop. So he stopped. Why? Because there's one rule of law for the PAP and one rule of law for the opposition. Okay? So the actual practice of the elections itself also has serious voter intimidation. On paper, it seems fair. But what happens is when it comes to vote, right, your ballot paper has a serial number to prevent forgery. And so the polling officer, when you come, you hand in your poll card, the polling officer will issue you with a ballot and then write down your polling number on the counter foil next to the ballot. And then the polling officer will read out your name off the electoral register and your polling number and strike you off. 
to monitor that the election is free and fair, every party is permitted to have a polling agent seated um, opposite the uh, polling officials. Okay. So what happens with a, when a voter comes in is that um, they, there's this person seated all in white behind you. And this person looks at you and is probably a member of the local residence committee, which, for example, issues funding, which decides your parking permits, which you know, uh, sets, um, you know, issues permits, issues funding, issues activities, you know, uh, issues permits for activities. They have huge influence over your life. And this person is sitting there and they have an electoral register in front of them. And so when the polling official the, announces your name and your polling number, they will strike it off, the polling agent will strike it off their list. And so it's a huge amount of intimidation because there's a PAP official sitting right behind you, you know, knowing that you voted and then glaring at you as you walk to the polling booth. Now, in theory, right, the, the serial number on the ballot paper is to prevent forgery. But if you are crazy or brave or good enough to break all the different levels of security and physically go into the Supreme Court basement and pull out the ballots, in theory, it's really far-fetched, but you can match people to their vote, right? This has never happened, and I stress, it's never happened, it probably won't ever happen because of the sheer difficulty. It's a massive logistical exercise to you know, get all these different, to match the ballot to the number, the number to the voter, and figure everything out. But this creates this fear in people's minds that your vote is not secret, right? That the person behind you is keeping track of you, that you voted, they're reminding you that they have power over you, and that your vote is, you know, potentially can be revealed. And this is a terrifying experience for somebody, especially when this person controls so much of your life. You see? So wouldn't you also, if you were in that situation, think twice about voting for the opposition? And this leads me to my next point, which is that the PAP controls all the statutory boards and grassroots organizations who get to decide how money is spent at the local level in Singapore. Right? If I were to ask you, you know, as a reasonable person, who decides how money is spent in a constituency? You might say, oh, surely it's the elected official. But you'd be completely wrong. The elected official does not control money. The People's Association controls the money. In 1960, the PAP created the People's Association specifically as a grassroots organization to connect them to the people, right? And officially, it's a statutory board, but in practice, it is an arm of the PAP. In 1986, the Citizens Consultative Committee was formed. In 1977, residence committees were formed. And these make local decisions, disperse money, and control local resources. And the people on these committees are all appointed by the PAP, and the local MP has no influence over them. So if the local MP wants to use the facilities, he has to ask them, he or she has to ask them. You know, they disburse the money to him or her, right? And if it's a PAP MP, they say yes. If it's an opposition MP, they say no. If the PAP MP loses, that losing MP is then pointed as the grassroots advisor to the People's Association so that they still control the money, right? And that's why, you know, there are when opposition MPs get elected, they are unable to do anything because they have no control over local resources, local funding. So the committees also have their ears to the ground, right? They are the channels to problems. People will feedback problems about your local estate, problems around you to these committees. If it's a PAP MP, they will tell the MP who will do something about it. If it's an opposition MP, they will tell them nothing. The opposition MP remains ignorant. And then the committee goes back to the resident and says, oh, this MP sucks. They, they didn't do anything for your problem. So this is, you know, the residence committees um, in UNOS after the, PAP, uh, the Workers' Party won there in 2011 were instructed specifically not to work with the Workers' Party. It's not, this is not a theoretical, you know, it is a well-documented effect that the Workers' Party was unhappy and furious about. But the, the peak of this system, the, 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 cold, the capping off point of the system, is the town councils, which were created in 1986. In 1981 and 84, uh, two constituencies in Singapore were audacious enough to elect opposition MPs. So in 1986, the PAP created town councils, which specifically tied provision of local services, local utilities, your water, your rubbish collection, to your constituency, which makes no sense, right? It's, um, you know, because these borders change all the time, and then 
it's, it's very inefficient to have some tiny councils and there's some massive ones, but that's the idea. If you vote for an opposition MP, the PAP can, in theory, cut off your taps. In practice, what happens is public services are unfunded or underfunded in your constituency and you are punished. So the town council is a powerful tool for the government to punish opposition voters. And this happened in 2011 when, Al -Junid, when the Workers' Party won Aljunit GRC. And in the four years since, the town council has been beset with huge problems. They haven't been given the money they're owed, right? And the, before the Workers' Party could take control of the town council, property that was leased by the town council was suddenly handed over to the People's Association so that your playing fields, your badminton halls, your public spaces, suddenly the Workers' Party town council could not use it. It was suddenly, it was now owned by the People's Association, you know, which denied the town council permission to use publicly funded, publicly owned spaces. So the broader principle right, in Singapore is that the PAP controls your housing, your money, they control your life. If you live in an HDB flat, right, the PAP controls that and your savings are, are sunk into that. They, own, they control your pension funds, they control your Medisave, your money is automatically taxed to put money into your pension funds. So your homes, your savings, your, you know, your whole life is controlled by the PAP, which under the law can actually take these away. Right? If you misbehave, they can and they have in the past taken you know, the homes, the roofs over people's heads, taken away their CPF for people who don't toe the line. So the whole system is set up to punish misbehavior, to punish a lack of obedience to the PAP. And of course, the people's associations, the residence committees, the CCCs also provide a steady stream of grassroots volunteers to the PAP. And this leads me to my third point, which is control of the information and the media. All right, for the past few years, and in particular through the campaign period, as I mentioned, the PAP accused the Workers' Party of incompetence and corruption at their town councils. Right? And this was problems created by the PAP, by the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, of National Development, to trip up the Workers' Party, right? But what the media dutifully reported was, oh, incompetence and corruption by the Workers' Party Town Council. They didn't do anything that a PAP Town Council hasn't done. But the media focused on the Workers' Party, they focused on potential corruption, and you know, they called into question the Workers' Party's competence, but this also served throughout the election campaign to remind people, if you vote PAP, you, uh, you, if you vote opposition, the PAP will punish you. So more broadly, of course, the control of the media allows the uh, PAP to keep the narrative where they want to, and they promote fear. You know, they, they talked about instability in China. You know, there was that big stock market slide in China. Malaysia, where the ringgit has, has fallen to three to the Sing dollar, right? They, they, there's this narrative of insecurity, of Singapore's vulnerability, regional instability. That means that, you know, that will push people towards voting for the conservative choice, voting for the stable choice, which is the PAP. And also, of course, this, uh, you know, banging on about candidates of integrity, attacking Dr. Chi Sun Juan, talking about the fear of a freak result leading to, you know, the Singapore collapsing, right? So control of information and the media has a lot of implications, which I think all of you are aware of, right? You create not just the information, but the values and assumptions which shape our world. Things we don't even think about, things we don't even question, right, are controlled because the PAP is able to control all these narrative streams. But I just want to highlight one other thing, which is that Singapore does not allow opinion polls before the general election or exit polls. So the whole country is, in effect, one huge prisoner's dilemma. And all of you are familiar with the philosophical question, the prisoner's dilemma, right? So most, if not all people, agree, okay, opposition is, in principle, a good thing. We want opposition in Singapore. But the problem is, who will vote for opposition, right? If I vote for opposition, I will get punished. My taps might get cut off, right? My town council won't get funded. So I want opposition, but I want someone else to vote for opposition. And the only way we can all avoid getting punished is if all of us vote opposition, right? Prisoner's dilemma. But we know, we agree, we all know the PAP is going to win. So what incentive do we have to vote opposition knowing that we will get punished because the PAP will definitely win? You see? So the best possible outcome for the opposition is one-third of the seats. 
And because of the chatter online, social media, everyone assumed, I think, that a lot of people, other people, were going to vote opposition. So I can safely vote PAP in my constituency, not get published, uh, punished, but other constituencies will go opposition, and they will provide the opposition for Singapore. And this prisoner's dilemma helps explain, I think partly explain, why you know, the PAP ended up with 70% of the vote, 9% 9% higher than 2011, right? So these are some of the structural factors. So let's turn to this specific election and to more, to more of the positive effects which drove people to the PAP. And the first, of course, is the death of Lee Kuan Yew and SG50, right? The death of Lee Kuan Yew contributed to a massive wave of sympathy that built up into the whole propaganda campaign of Singapore's 50th year since our separation from Malaysia. And the government threw huge amounts of money and time and effort transforming the whole country into a shrine for Lee Kuan Yew and also to bang on about this narrative. Lee Kuan Yew built Singapore, PAP built Singapore. You should be grateful to the PAP if you want 50 more years. And you know this took some really hilarious turns in the election because you know, one MP, or a few MPs actually said, our manifesto has no promises. It's very easy to make promises. Instead, we have a track record of the past, and if you want more of it, vote PAP. You know, which is crazy. What kind of manifesto, political manifesto, does not contain election promises? But they proudly said, we don't promise anything. But, they, but at the same time, on the stump, you know, a lot of politicians would all go, oh, if you vote us, we will build this, we will build that, a new hawker centre, new shopping centre, new bus, you know. So $50 million, you know, $100 million, all these promises. But it's all part of this narrative of development. The PAP has developed Singapore. And, you know, so this was the whole year, you know, just a whole year of this nationalist narrative forced down everyone's, uh, everyone's throat, right? And... You know, this narrative is not strictly true as a historian, right? I can tell you these narratives are not strictly true, but of course politicians have always had a very relaxed relationship with the truth, right? It's not about what is true, but what is, what is truthy, what sounds true. But perhaps the most important factor, I think, that the PAP addressed, um, not necessarily solved, but addressed, uh, they addressed to some degree many of the issues which drove the protest vote, which drove voter anger in 2011. And the first and the most important of this is healthcare. And perhaps the most important speech of this on this was won by Lim Sui Se. It was overshadowed because in that same speech, he insulted China and Malaysia. So everyone focused on that the next day. But earlier in that speech, he said something which was more important. So I'm going to play that for you now. So a few years ago, many people say, in Singapore, healthcare costs so expensive that you can afford to die. You cannot afford to fall sick. Huh? I see, I see so he starts out by admitting the Correct problem. Not. Healthcare costs were crazy Correct out of control. Ago. Now he explains Since how then, they solved it. We have Medishu Life. We have Pioneer Generation Package, PGP. Your 20,000, 30,000 after government subsidies will drop to about 8,000 to 10,000. If you're on Medishu, your burden will drop 8,000, 10,000 by about half your 4,000, 5,000 will drop to about 3,000. It will cover you for life. Now, if you want a birth pioneer generation, you'll be able to enjoy MediShield life for free. For those of you 71 to 75, government give you $400 a, month, a year. 76 to 80, $600 a year. Net, net. How much? I say about 100 to 200. Oh. Then those 66 to 70 say, what about us? Net net, ah, ah, half price. Us, too young to be pioneer generation. Not to worry, since January this year, additional medicine. Ah. Two thirds of Singaporeans will receive permanent discount from the government. And on, but before I go to the hospital, ah, I got to see a lot, the doctor a lot of times, you know. Polyclinic, SOC, also cost money. Ah, I said, no problem. So if you have uh, IC, Blue card, orange card, plus PG card, $100, 50 25 $12.50. Hobo! So you see, he started out with saying an operation cost 20000 and by the middle of that, he was saying it was effectively free for anyone who was above a certain age and hugely reduced in price for anyone above 65, right? 
and also uh, just visiting a doctor, right? From $100, now you're down to $12.50. So, you know, th this, this was a huge uh, in money giveaway, basically. And it was also a huge scam because, for example, for a dentist, they're allowed to do this for one treatment. So what happened was a lot of people over 65 would see a dentist, get one tooth fixed, a new crown. You know, that's hundreds of dollars for $10. And then that dentist would refer them to their friend who would do another tooth for $10 and you'd get your whole mouth done for $10 a tooth. So imagine the amount of money that was you know, being um, poured you know, out by the government. And this explains right, why... If, oh, here we go. So how is the government paying for this? Last year, they put $8 billion right here. $8 billion into a special fund for the Pioneer Generation Package. And that's to be spent over the next four years. $8 billion. So, to put that into some context, they were spending about $300 million before, right? Now they're spending $2 billion a year. And uh, it, by contrast, defense is about $12 billion, okay? So you can see they were really underspending on healthcare in the past, and they just admitted it, and now they've thrown $2 billion a year. So, you know, at the problem, and just basically, fix the problem by funding, by, by you know, all this deficit spending. Because if you look at it, right, this year, um, we had the highest ever tax collection, $46 billion, and we still end up with $6.67 billion in deficit. Right? Our highest ever tax collection and massive deficit. So they basically you know, solved the problem by throwing huge, huge, huge amounts of money at it. But they also changed the way that MediShield works. This is now compulsory for all citizens e and PRs, permanent residents, even if you don't live in Singapore. So those of you who are Singaporean here, now you have to pay an additional tax. And if you don't pay it, you're, tax, you're, you're a tax evader. Right? And this tax is for MediShield Life and it goes into the, into the pot and it helps fund healthcare for voters in Singapore. So that's how they're paying, that's part of how they're paying for it, by taxing Singaporeans who can't vote. Because if you live abroad, there are very strict rules about how you can vote. You know, you have to be back in Singapore for like 10 days every year, and you have to go to a polling station. You can't vote by post. So if you live in, say, Kansas, you're out of luck. You have to go to San Francisco, you have to go to New York. You know, if you live in, I don't know, Urumqi, you have to go to either Beijing or you have to come here or to Shanghai, you know. So there are a lot of Singaporeans who can't vote who will get taxed to pay for MediShield Life. So, other policies that address this, the, the issues, right? Housing. Kobun One introduced a lot of policies to cool the housing market, to prevent uh, houses being bought by foreigners and then flip for a quick profit. You know, they embarked on a big building boom. Immigration. There were crackdowns on foreigners, fewer PRs and uh, you know, new citizen applications processed. It became much higher for harder for businesses to hire foreigners. Uh, there was a strengthening of citizens' rights and privileges as compared to foreigners, for example, raising of school fees. Transport, they couldn't do anything with transport. So what they did was they fired the transport minister. Right? There are massive breakdowns, uh, and uh, there's like a minor breakdown every week on our MRT. It's nothing like your system here, which seems to work great. Our system breaks down every, every week, either in a minor, and there have been major, major breakdowns. Half the system broke down earlier this year. Right? So, funnily enough, a survey in January by the online citizen asked voters, right, who would you like to see out of, the, out of parliament? Which PAP MP? And the top three people, Ma Bao Tan, Lui Tuck Yu, the transport minister, Wong Kan Sing, the former home affairs minister, all three of them were asked to step down two weeks or three weeks before nomination day. So maybe the PAP was reading the online independent media because clearly they knew what was going on on the ground. Get rid of the most unpopular people. Funnily enough, the fourth most unpopular person, Kho Boon Wan, uh, is now going to be the new transport minister. So good luck to him. Although they've invested so much money in transport now, he will preside over a lot of openings. So maybe that will save him. So one of the PAP's claims, right, which you hear all over and over again all over the world, is because of this monopoly on power, it can prioritize long-term planning, you know, and policies over short-term demands. This is, of course, historically untrue. The PAP uh, built itself up in the 50s and 60s on a strong populist campaign, on a strong uh, social welfare platform, before abandoning it once it had um, cemented its grip on power in the 1970s. 
They then invented this narrative in the 80s to justify their increased crackdowns, the re removal of democracy and free elections within the system and so on. And this is the narrative they've been peddling for the last couple of decades. But we can see because of this, it is clearly untrue. Right? MediSafe, MediShield Life, the budget deficit, the way it's funded, the way it's structured. In the last few years, its policies have been unashamedly populist with the aim of winning this election. And let me remind you, this is in spite of the fact that the PAP already knew it was going to win. 16 out of 89 seats was the best case scenario for the opposition. So if they actually had courage in their convictions, they would have just said, we will stick with our policies and let the chips fall where they may. But no, the PAP has you know, shown this narrative of no democracy because we are a benevolent authoritarian government who know best and can plan, plan long term. It has shown this to be a complete myth. But the big winner from this election is the former finance minister, Deputy Prime Minister Taman Shamugaratnam, whom people feel is the best qualified person. He has succeeded right, because of the situation, the opportunities presented to him in the last few years of pulling Singapore and Singapore's economy to the left and building a much more inclusive economy. And his popularity has skyrocketed because of it and people acknowledge that he's the most talented person and a lot of people feel he should be the next Prime Minister. Okay, so what about the opposition then? How did they contribute to their, uh, to their you know, results, their lack of victory? Okay, and so the first thing I think uh, is that we can firmly conclude that this wasn't a repudiation of the opposition. The swing of 9% is firmly within recent results. You know, people act like it's a huge swing but the last four election swings, right, the last four elections saw swings of 10%, 8%, 7%, 9%. So this is typical within the last two decades. Since the introduction of the current system of elections in 1988, the PAP has historically been in the mid-60s and has moved between 60 and 70%. So again, this is within historical norms. And indeed, if we look at the number of seats, which is more important in a Westminster system, the Workers' Party successfully defended all six seats that it won in 2011. And I think if they defend it again at the next election, we can conclude that this is basically a new baseline for opposition, that people have concluded that you, know, you need at least some opposition, even if it's only six seats out of 89. When it comes to vote share as well, Alex Au, the commentator, the blogger, has broken down the vote share here. And you'll note that the swing Right, is particularly against all these smaller parties, the less credible ones, but the two big parties both had uh, less than 5% swing against them, which is much less than the 9% uh, swing nationally. Right? And if you look in key constituencies, including Holland Bukit Timah, right, where the SDP, Dr. Chi Sun Juan, and the hugely respected uh, Dr. Paul Tambaya ran, the SDP's vote share barely changed. Holland Bukit Tima, uh, the percentage changed because Holland Bukit Tima's boundaries changed quite drastically and a lot of new constituency uh, districts were added to it, right? So gerrymandering again. And the Workers' Party again in Al Junit, you know, they their vote share fell by three percent. Right? The exception is Pongo East. Compared to 2011, their vote share increased a lot, but compared to 2013, it also decreased just slightly. So you can see then, you know, compared to say one of the marginal small parties, right, which saw massive drops, the SDP and Workers' Party, where they ran their credible candidates, barely saw any, uh, any fall. Okay. So the opposition's campaign, right, was made on the argument that electing six Workers' Party MPs into parliament in 2011 had caused the PAP to respond by moving left and addressing their main concerns. And I think this is true, this is very true, and the people recognize that. But that was what they were campaigning on. The argument was that you should elect more opposition to produce more checks and balances so that the PAP will be, you know, more will move further left and will have will take care of Singapore better. And this is the problem, I think, right? Because first of all, shouldn't you reward the party that actually did things? did what you wanted instead of rewarding the other party. You know, there's a certain sense of justice about rewarding the PAP for making things better. Second, you run into the problem, as I mentioned, the prisoner's dilemma. Who is going to be the one who, who takes one for the team, who elects the opposition, right? Who is going to get risk getting punished for the next four years in doing so? The third thing is, how much opposition do you need to be a check and balance? In a Westminster-style system, you need only half 
plus one to be completely powerful, right? You look at David Cameron and his previous coalition government, right? They were a minority government and they achieved almost all of their um, agenda, right? And the Liberal Democrats looked like idiots at the end of it and lost, you know, a lot of support, right? So in a Westminster South system, right, it, you only need this one, you know, half the seats plus one to have, to be all powerful. So even if you elect 16 opposition MPs or even 20 or 24 opposition MPs, right, it would still be nowhere near the half needed to, uh, you know, it would still not be any, any different from electing six in many ways. And fourth, I think we talk a lot about social media in Singapore and how it's democratized information, but it also works the other way. The PAP has done a very good job um, with its own social media, but it also means that in the past where opposition MPs are the only people who can speak directly to government MPs, and so you go through your opposition MP to access your government MP, the PAP has become very good at speaking to people directly through Facebook. Singapore politics is very much done, you know, and activism is done through Facebook, right? And if you message your MP on Facebook, there's actually a very good chance that he or she will respond. So they have gotten better at that. But the thing, of course, is this narrative of checks and balances was the only viable strategy, I think, for the opposition's campaign. They know that they don't have enough people to form an alternative government. So instead, they have to take credit for all the good things that happened in the last four years and urge people to say, if you want more good things, vote for us. And that was the only play, and it was flawed. Some opposition parties, of course, tried to campaign on very divisive issues. And in particular, Sing Singaporeans First, Sing First, and the Reform Party, and a few of the other small ones, uh, campaigned on immigration, which was the nadir of the government's popularity in 2013, when um, there was a huge rally at Hong Lim Park, several huge rallies, in fact, against this unrestricted immigration and an immigration policy which many people felt favoured foreigners. And as I mentioned, the government has taken steps to address this, but more importantly, I think this strictly, this very xenophobic tone by the Reform Party and Sing First uh, turned a lot of people off. Singaporeans are descendants of immigrants, and we recognise you know, that the problem is government policy, not other immigrants. But also, you know, some people have argued that the new citizen vote was what swung it for the government, right? People who, foreigners who've come in and have been handed their citizenship very quickly, and these people voted solidly for the government. And anecdotally, you do see that. As a polling agent, I saw a lady who was clearly from Beijing who came in and she asked, you know, which one is the government party? She asked the polling uh, official, which one is the government party? I want to vote for that. And the polling official could not tell her by law. So they just said, oh, this is the PAP, this is the SDP. So she said, yes, but which one is the government party? And they wouldn't tell her. So she went to the polling booth and stood there for ages staring at it, trying to figure out which one is the government party. She took longer than any other voter that day. So clearly, there is a lot of support for the PAP among new voters. But studies have shown that this made up no more than 2% of the electorate. And anyway, a citizen is a citizen. You can't differentiate based on how long someone has come. If you are a citizen, you should have all the legal rights and be treated as such. And I think you know, the opposition parties, the more credible ones, recognize that. right? And so they didn't have that same strident xenophobic tone, they said the problem is policy, we need to address the policy. But, you know, I think opposition parties could also go further than that and, you know, take the bull by the horns and say, you know, we recognize that new citizens also have problems and we uh, will have policies to address these problems, so new citizens should vote for us as well. But this also leads to my next point, which is a lack of differentiation among the opposition. And this is another problem that the opposition had this solidarity where they refused to attack each other, where they did not run against each other in any constituency except for one, you know, that was McPherson and some independent candidates. So there was only one three-way fight. Otherwise, it was a straight choice between PAP and opposition. And this, and on the hustings, the opposition parties did not attack each other. So this allowed the PAP to then create this impression that all the opposition parties are the same, and by attacking one, they attacked all of them. And so they were able to use some of the things that the marginal parties were saying and use that to smear all the parties, including the big responsible ones like the Workers' Party and SDP. Right? So I think this lack of differentiation also damaged the opposition, and they need to differentiate themselves better in the future. So of the two credible parties, the SDP and the Workers' Party, Right? The SDP has consistently spoken up for social justice, and they are known as the Social Justice Party, right? the party of principle. 
The Workers' Party, on the other hand, has previously sought to differentiate itself more on competence than on values, and they've been more elusive on what they stand for. So, even though its manifesto in this current election, in the recent election, made a clear differentiation in the PAP, I think a lot of people still saw the Workers' Party as basically PAP light, you know, with a friendlier version of the PAP. The joke is they are the PAP minus 10%, right? Any policy the PAP presents, the Workers' Party will say, oh, we agree in principle, but it should be 10% less. You know, they're 10% to the left of the PAP. But what no one realized was the PAP is capable of moving 10% to the left, as they did in the last few years. And they've occupied much of the space that the Workers' Party was trying to occupy. See? And so, you know, th this is their undoing, right? And of course, running on competence right, also has problems because the PAP was able to use all its structural controls over taxes, over the grassroots organizations, over the law to sabotage the Workers' Party, and then to use that to call the Workers' Party's competence into question, right? As I said, they did nothing wrong. They did nothing that a PAP town council also hadn't done. But because of the control of the media, the PAP could then attack the other foundational pillar of the Workers' Party. So, in sum, you can see the choices in front of the voter, right? The structural aspects, knowing that the PAP controls the entire situation. The negative incentive against the opposition, knowing that the PAP is going to win, knowing that you're going to be punished. The positive incentive for the PAP, that the PAP has changed and addressed the situation. That the opposition doesn't have much to offer. That the Workers' Party will almost certainly win a few seats and thereby provide checks and balances. And so, in sum, you can see why you know, a lot of people chose to vote PAP. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Uh, we can have, if you're interested, we can have a discussion on then how the opposition can change and where Singapore is going from here. We can leave that for the Q and A. But uh, I think uh, we'll we'll stop we'll stop here and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very interesting discussion. Um, can I uh, lead off by asking you a quick question uh, on the social media side of it? Um, I have a lot of friends who are Singaporeans uh, in, in the United States, and to watch the election via social media, especially Facebook, through my friends, uh, Singaporean friends in the U.S., is, is very enlightening, and you, you alluded to that. So I'm really curious about the youth vote. I mean, there were talk about you know, uh, how the youth vote last U.S. election now, uh, or the, the eight years ago, affected the, the Obama. But can you talk a bit about the youth vote in, in, in light of, I mean, you mentioned the PAP have been very effective in using social media, but I'm just, did, they, did the, the youth went for the SG50 and, and the Lee Kuan Yew uh, uh, tributes? Is that, yeah, I'm curious about the youth. Thanks. I think um, there is this assumption that the youth were going to vote opposition, which has shown to be not true. I think the youth are more engaged. They do use more social media. But of course, social media works both ways. The PAP has become very good at utilizing social media, at connecting straight to the people. Uh, they have what they openly call internet brigades, which are people who will go out there and seek to correct misperceptions. But uh, at the same time, there are websites which create things which are blatantly false. right? And you can tell because there's no names to these websites. They create propaganda. But the, the point is the PAP has become much more sophisticated with social media. You know, 2011 might have been the peak um, of opposition use of social, of opposition monopoly of social media. But there are also pro-PAP news websites, you know, and there are more independent news websites that crowd out the online citizen, which is the only really remaining credible uh, independent news media. So there's that. When it comes to the youth vote, uh, again, you have to remember structurally, right, there is a massive uh, indoctrination from young through the educational system. We're all required to do things called, you know, civics and national education, which inculcates you, you with certain values, which inculcates you with a certain narrative. And uh, they're also affected, of course, by SG50, by the whole narrative that the PAP, you know, made Singapore, created Singapore. So all these feed into this overall impression. When it comes to the opposition, you know, I think um, people also, I mean, you know, young people still also are susceptible to many of the other factors I talked about, fear, you know, for example, uh, idea, the idea that if you vote opposition, the government will know, and if you therefore are reliant on uh, government contracts or something. You know, the government's by far the biggest part of Singapore's economy. Um, I think, so, 
overall, the youth, I think, are, you know, the same things that engage the youth uh, can be used by both sides, right? And the same structural factors which affect people who are older also affect the youth, you know. And admittedly, okay, the, uh, you know, um, things like MediShield life, you know, youth won't care so much about that. But there are other factors which, you know, the government can address. You know, housing was something that a lot of young, uh, younger adults who were wanted to get their own homes were struggling with. That has been addressed, you know. Um, so I think because we don't have information, this is a huge problem. No surveys, no opinion polls, right? We don't exactly know how the youth voted. But I would suspect that, uh, you know, you'd see the older you know, post-65 people are much more solid block for the PAP and the youth much more accepting of this idea that we need checks and balances and so probably voted higher percentage of the opposition. But at the end of the day, it's impossible to say because there's no information and we don't know. Yeah. Questions? Here, Andrew? Well, well, first of all, thank you for sharing the very interesting Singaporean uh, electoral experience with us. Uh, you started off by saying that Singapore is not a real democracy um, because there are so many things, uh, so many aspects stacked uh, in favor of the PAP that has effectively become a one-party state. Uh, but on the other hand, on the other side, the PAP does deliver, does actually moving ahead with the times delivering what the people want. So there is a high degree of legitimacy. So my question to you is that, um, would you be able to theorize, based on the Singaporean experience, uh, about the dynamics uh, and the sustainability of a one-party state, uh, bearing in mind that no matter how many parties you have, um, two parties, three parties, or like Afghanistan, you know, so over 10 parties, that can be only one government at any one time. So provided that the only one government continues to deliver, there is no necessary um, kind of uh, argument saying that a one-party state uh, cannot be sustainable. Uh, would you be able to generalize or theorize you know, based on a Singaporean experience? And what are the dynamics uh, for okay. the sustainability thanks, of one-party state? Thanks. That's a common question that I get. It's a common you know, story about Singapore. And the first thing I always point out is that it's historically not true, right? The PAP creates this idea that, uh, you know, as long as, first of all, as long as uh, that, that being this one party means that they can do all the planning and means that they are more efficient and as long as they deliver, right? But uh, historically, that's not true because the PAP, let's not forget, started out as an opposition party and won the 1955 elections by distinguishing themselves from the then government and, uh, you know, uh, having a, a clear platform of values and a clear plan, right? But also the kind of policies that they then implemented, the big successes of Singapore, were none of them were their idea. They appropriated ideas from other people, right? If you look at Singapore, if you think of our great successes, you'd say, oh, housing, pension funds, education, industrialization, none of these came from the PAP. Housing was the Labour Front government, pension funds was the colonial government, industrialization was Albert Winsemius, education came from a 1956 all-party report on education. So what the PAP did was they took these ideas and they executed them to perfection, right? They were really good at executing. And what you see in the mid-70s is as the PAP recognizes that the world is changing, the economy is changing, they need to change the basis of the economy, right? They implement a bunch of ideas which on paper sound really good. The 1978 um, report on education by Go King Sui, the second industrial revolution, you know, the change of how HDBs are funded, right? And this is a massive disaster for the PAP, leads to a massive recession in Singapore, leads to the cost of uh, housing skyrocketing, you know, leads to foreign investment fleeing Singapore, right? And the PAP's response is number one, not to take responsibility but to remove the ability of people to hold them accountable. So instead of you know, saying we screwed up and accepting, what they do is they introduce in the mid 80s a lot of the reforms I talked about. The GRCs, the elected presidency, the town councils, right? They seek to uh, fix the opposition. They sue JB, Jerry Ratnam, you know, within an inch of his life, bankrupt him, destroy him. Uh, then Lee Kuan Yew says, oh, it's the fault of my colleagues in the old guard. So he kicks out Go Keng Sui, To Chin Chai, Ong Pang Boon, Raja Ratnam, but he doesn't kick out himself. He is unaccountable, 
the other people are accountable, kick them out. And he brings in new blood, you know, the Go Chok Tong, Tony Tan, uh, Dana Balan, Jaya Kuma generation. So the PAP has made massive screw-ups in the past, and back when Singapore still had some form of electoral freedom, people sought to punish them and hold them accountable. And the PAP then, instead of you know, responding to that, sought to remove that accountability, creating the system today. Which leads to the obvious question, right? If the PAP is so confident that its decisions are correct, that it's long-term planning, that it can deliver, why doesn't it have free and fair elections? Because you know, what then does it, is, does it have to be afraid of? The fact that it needs to rig the elections to such a great degree, needs to rig Singapore to such a great degree, means that they don't have confidence that Singaporeans recognize you know, what they do, or even that what they do might not necessarily be the, the best thing. And you know, if Singaporeans realize that, then they might get voted out of power. Right? So you know, if you're doing well, why do you need to fix things? So this argument is very seductive, but the problem is, Right, in the future, what's going to happen? And I've said that um, you know, Singapore, the PAP could actually muddle along for the next 40, 50, indefinitely, if it has someone smart in power, because they control all the levers of power, right? They control the stat boards, they control the funding, they control the, uh, you know, all the, the different tiers, they control media, you know. They control it all. So they could actually muddle along for a really, really long time. But history has shown us that it's unsustainable. Eventually, something really, really bad will happen that they can't control. A uh, sort of black swan event. You know, uh, economic crisis, you know, natural disaster, whatever, right? We've seen it happen elsewhere in, in Asia, around the world. And the question is then what happens? Because the people will desert the PAP and vote opposition. And if the opposition is not ready, right, things could become even worse for Singapore. It's in the PAP's interest, if they truly had Singapore's interest uh, in the long run, to have to stimulate uh, a, a viable, responsible, experienced opposition who could then not just be ready to take over, but in the current time also provide a different source of ideas. So to go back to my first point, the PAP you know, ran into difficulties in the late 70s and early 80s precisely because it had stopped listening to ideas from outside the party. Right? And that's why they had these, you know, in, on paper, great ideas. They recognized the information technology age was coming way before anyone else. How they implemented it was a huge mess, a huge disaster. They tried to unilaterally force people to pay people more wages and unilaterally incentivize everyone to have more education. You know, they assumed they could legislate change, social change, you know, and you can't do that, right? But if there was an opposition to come up with different ideas to debate, to discuss and say, okay, this is good, but this isn't how it works on the ground, you know, or to say, okay, this idea is good, but it needs to be tweaked, or I have a different idea, which is actually something of your idea, but even better, right? Then Singapore would be in a far stronger place. So it's this diversity and dissent in democracy in the 50s, before the PAP got into power, that actually laid the foundation for its success over the next 10 years. And by destroying this diversity and debate and different ideas, led it to the problems of the late 70s, early 80s, led it to create the system we have today. Right? And that's why there have been no fundamental changes to our economy since the 80s, because they, they're terrified of what happens if they actually take genuine change. And you, know, you can't argue that just muddling along with the same policies forever is going to be fine for Singapore. We know the world is changing. We know things need to change. The PAP is not changing Singapore to reflect that. So even what we see today is not reflecting this narrative. Right over here. Hi, I'm Toh Han Shi, a, a freelance writer. Um, just, I think, two questions. One is, you said that the Transport Minister Louis Tuck Yew was sacked. Can you confirm it? Because he and the Prime Minister Lee Shen Long said that, oh, you know, uh, uh, Louis Tuck Yew wanted to resign voluntarily, but the Prime Minister detained him for many months and then reluctantly accepted his resignation. So, what's the true story? My second question is, do you think the ongoing leadership transition within the ruling PAP for the next few years could be that black swan event that could change things very radically for Singapore? Like there could be an internal split within the PAP, there could be real uh, power struggles within the PAP over who should be the prime minister, and maybe suddenly the Thaman becomes the prime minister, although someone, the other person, is the preferred candidate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Okay. Um, tough questions. I think the first one, I I will say, okay. It's a uh, speculation, uh, but I think it's kind of it's well founded because given Louis Tung Yu's length of service, 
uh, how he was spoken about as a potential future leader, um, and how you know he was positioned within the party. It was widely expected that he would form part of that next generation that we are talking about. So the fact is that he was asked to, I you know that that, that he decided to step down. Either it could have been his own decision, it could have been the prime minister's. We don't know, but I think that. Um, transport was undoubtedly a massive, massive issue that he did not handle it well. He communicated very poorly. He was widely mocked online for his responses, for the fact that, you know, when um, the breakdowns happened, you know, he was nowhere to be seen and he, uh, you know, made some really defensive comments about how he was satisfied with things, with the response. And, you know, so I, I mean, we, it's, Kremlinology, right? We don't know for sure what went on internally, but it's it seems very reasonable to conclude that there's this massive problem and he took responsibility for it. Um, in the bigger picture, I I don't know if it matters that much. Uh, the second question was uh, the next generation of leadership. I don't think it's a black swan event because I think it's it's part of the process. It's not the problem itself. The problem I think will be external to the PAP. Uh, there is one thing that people have been bringing up, which I'll get to in a second. But if you look at the PAP right now, their control is, is absolute. And there's some, one of the candidates they brought in at the recent elections, a general by the name of Ng Chi Ming, right? Um, if you look at his family, right, at one point, he and his two brothers, one was chief of Air Force, one was chief of Navy, and one was chief of Army. And now, one is a politician who's being spoken of as potentially the next prime minister or very heavyweight, one is the head of the CPF, controlling the pension funds, and one is the head of uh, the military security division. So they, you know, it could be one family controlling politics and the money and the, you know, the security services. You see. So you know, they, they have created this tight-knit elite uh, who are all related by marriage or blood or, or close friendship, or they go to the same church or things like that. And it is, um, they all have way too much to lose to start fighting with each other. You know, there is this, if you read Michael Barr's work, he goes through and, you know, how all these elites are so connected to each other and there's this common definition of, uh, you know, what it means to be elite, right? Singapore does not have meritocracy except within this narrow 1%. Um, I don't think Thaman would be elected, would be picked as prime minister. He's very loyal to Lee Sien Long, right? He, Lee Sien Long's patronage made his career. Without him, he wouldn't be anywhere. But he also recognizes, I think, that he wouldn't command the kind of support necessary to be prime minister. Uh, I think he's happy with what he's done in the last few years. He successfully pulled Singapore towards the left, made it more caring, you know. Um, and he's openly said, I'm not interested. You know? So despite his personal popularity, the PAP's dominance means that people within the party can be more concerned with internal politics than electoral success. Now, the one thing I mentioned earlier is that recently we've had hints of infighting in the Lee family, right? And Lee Sien Yang and Lee Wei Ling have sued the government over some of Lee Kuan Yew's possessions. And when, they say, when I say sued the government, what people understand it to mean is actually it's uh, Ho Ching, the wife of Lee Sien Lung, you know, and uh, their desire to control the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew versus the executors of Lee Kuan Yew's will, which is Lee Wei Ling, his daughter, and his younger son, Lee Sien Yang. So the fact that these two have sued the government means that there is some fighting between them over Lee Kuan Yew's legacy, and that may be something that would lead to a potential split. But it's very unlikely because Lee Sien Lung and Ho Ching between them control the government and all the money. You know, and with Lee Kuan Yew dead, Lee Sien Yang and Lee Wei Ling have very little influence. So, but you know, that might be something, that would be something to watch. Um, I think on that note, uh, if there are no other questions, I want to thank Vijay. Thank you for that really interesting discussion. And, uh, and I hope to have you back in the future and to talk thank about you. future Thanks elections in, in Singapore. But on behalf of Asia Society, a small token of our appreciation.